if I see a cop, just drive by him, get off the freeway, flip around, and then go drive by him at like 120. When you get away, you, you have, you're so pumped up for the next eight to 12 hours. Like, you know, you couldn't sleep. It was just, you know, adrenaline coursing through your, through your system. That's when I started teaching them about the dark web because uh, everybody knew and they, and they were, they wanted to get involved basically. And I'm like, listen guys, I'm here because of this. <laughs> mm. Why, why do you want to get involved in this? Cause I'm, you know, this is, I'm in the same place you are. You're just going to come back if you get into this. Uh, basically world of Warcraft uh, hacks for a game. Yeah. <laughs> is it as, as, as a job? Yeah. Dave is a dark net cyber criminal and uh, he's got, you know, I talked to him for about an hour or so the other day, super interesting story. And um, so check it out. So l let's bro, let's start at the, let's start at the beginning. Like, I mean, where were you born? Uh, okay. So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and I was, I was born in 92. So I'm 30 years old right now. I uh, lived in Milwaukee f with my with both of my parents till uh, the mid two thousands, uh, which then we moved out uh, to a suburb, kind of about ten fifteen minutes outside of Milwaukee. Um, and then that's where I lived. Um, that's where that's where I'm currently at right now. Uh, well, so my dad uh, he was a truck driver. He drove uh, dump trucks like locally. He wasn't like an over the road thing, so he was you know. He was home every night, you know, he wasn't out uh, driving. So, and my mom, uh, she was like um, a book. Uh, she does like payroll and uh, yeah, bookkeeper uh, checks and checks and stuff like that um, for like an old folks uh, community, basically. <clears throat> so, hi, where'd you go to high school? Um, yep. Yeah, so, I, my first high school, um, my first high school I went to, I got expelled, uh, because, <laughs> why? Because I listen to this, man. Um, so I was, I was in basically study hall, which is right before lunch. Um, so I had a pipe in my backpack and I didn't have any weed or anything like that, but I went uh, to the bathroom, I took a, you know, took a little hit off of whatever was left in that pipe, you know, just, uh, I was bored, you know, study hall, I was, I didn't really care about, you know, school at that point, so I was just, uh, trying to get high and, and hang out, basically, so I come back from the bathroom, and this, uh, this girl that was sitting, uh, behind me to the left, uh, Apparently she she smelled uh, she smelled like that I smelled like weed, and uh, she basically texted her mom. Her mom called the school office. The school office then alerted the uh, security there. They came down, and all of a sudden I notice there is you know a teacher that comes in and just kind of walks through and she's looking around and and and, and probably about a minute or two into her doing that, I realized that she's kind of really just focusing on me. Um, so I start devising a plan to get rid of this pipe that I have because they're obviously going to check me in. Um, I know I don't have anything in my locker, so that's good. So uh, study hall gets let out. I I jet over to the lunchroom and I uh, I see one of my buddies in there and I hand the pipe off to him, and I say, "Hold on to this," you know. And I, I go, I go grab a tray. I get my food. I just get to my seat. I start eating, and all of the security and the principal come in, and they say, "We need to talk to you. Come with us." Um, so basically, they took me up to the office. They told me about the allegations. I I denied them, obviously. Um, I uh, basically you don't have the pipe on you. I didn't have it on me, so right, I, and I and I know I didn't have any. We had no paraphernalia, nothing else. So I said, "All right, you can search." They wanted to search my backpack, 
they want to search my locker, so we search the backpack in there. They find nothing. We go down to my locker. They pull it all out. They find nothing. So basically, I they don't really know what to do, basically, because uh, there's no proof that this happened. So they say, all right, well, we're going to suspend you. You need to go take a drug test at some lab and come back to us with the results. And then we'll let you back in, um, you know, if you pass. So I go do that. <clears throat> And it was about three or four days after I had taken that hit. And listen, I was smoking weed every day at that time. So it's in my system. Um, I go take the test. But before I go, I do kind of like an at-home detox type thing. Um, and then I basically w water down uh, my pee, right? Um, so I go and I pass. No, no drugs in my system. Take it back to them. That still wasn't enough for them. They said, uh, due to this allegation, uh, due to other past uh, incidents that I've had, because I was kind of, you know, not exactly the best student there. I was uh, influencing other kids and stuff like that. And, and they kind of knew about that after talking to other people. So <clears throat> they basically said, we're not going to let you back in. So they expelled me from that school. Uh, which leads me to the next school, uh, which is where I go. I start, uh, this is, let's see, freshman. This is the start of my sophomore year. So the first, probably like the first semester or so. So um, <clears throat> I get there. It's a public school. This other one was a private school. So that's basically why they were so strict on this whole, on the whole thing and, and expelling me. So now I'm at this public school and this is, you know, this is not a good uh, place to go when I'm, you know, clearly using drugs and stuff because there's tons of, tons of people there way more than at the other school that are using drugs, selling drugs, doing all kinds of stuff, skipping school. So <clears throat> that's when I start dabbling with a little bit more than just weed. Up, up until then, it was just weed, and, and occasionally I would, I would have some alcohol. So um, I start dabbling at this new high school, um, introduce new friends. We, uh, you know, club drugs, MDMA, you know, LSD, all that type of thing. Um, and that really, that really lit a spark. And I basically became really interested in like pharmacology, you know, how, how the drugs work systematically, what they affect, all that stuff. So uh, by the time I had graduated uh, that, that public school, I had already become uh, addicted to, um, Roxycodone uh, pills, basically, and also um, my buddy worked at a an old folks home, and he had access to uh, fent patches. So we were doing the fent patches, and we were um, sniffing oxy thirties and stuff like that. Uh, by the time I graduated high school, so I graduated in two thousand eleven, and in two thousand twelve. I guess um, is kind of when things went from went from just playing around to real life. Uh, a few of my friends OD'd. A few uh, uh, on yeah. on got the patches. Um, well, one of them OD'd on on heroin. One of them okay. OD'd on on um, Xanax and oxycodone, I believe. Um, and then, yeah, those are, those are the first two. That was in 2012, if those two first happened. So, um, 2012, I start college. Um, I'm going to a local, uh, I'm going to like kind of a local school, um, basically for a medical degree of some type. Um, since I became interested, you know, in the in the drug culture and all that stuff, it just made sense to me. 
um, to maybe go into the medical field. So I had that interest in pharmacology and medicine um, and you know mental health and, and how drugs can affect that and how they can help that and such. Um, so, you know, I was, I was still doing drugs uh, while I was going to college and stuff. And that, that really wasn't good because I would probably be at, you know, two classes a day if, if I even went that day. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing the greatest in college, but I'm making it. So during spring break 2013, um, I was down, I was downtown. Um, I was on the east side. I was on a side street. I'm walking and um, I get hit by a car. Um, it throws me. I I break my neck. Uh, three of my vertebrae. Um, Were you walking on the street? Well, I was cro- I was crossing on a side street. Okay. Sorry, so, it just, uh, I didn't this, realize this that. I thought you were like on the thought you were on the sidewalk or something. Somebody went no, up on no, the no. sidewalk. She, no, she just she just ran the stop sign while I was walking across the sidewalk, or I was walking from the sidewalk to the other side of the street. Okay. So, um, so she she hits me with her jeep. Um, I get thrown, um, break my neck, uh, a couple other you know things, but the neck was the most serious one. Uh, C four through C six is all fused together now, so range of motion is lacking. Uh, you know, pain stuff like that. Um, so. I get into surgery. Uh, well, anyway, they let me go back. So I, they hit me. I'm knocked out. Basically, I don't remember anything except for the impact. Um, and they get me, and they they sit me up. They try to sit me up on the sidewalk, but I couldn't sit up straight. I kept just falling over because I had no sense. I had no equilibrium, basically. I start the surgery uh, about a day after that accident. They had me in the hospital because um, they were concerned that about the drugs in my system because they did they did a blood test and they they found uh, they found H and, and some benzos and and stuff like that in my system. Um, so they waited a day. Uh, I start the surgery. Everything goes you know as well as it could according to the doctor, um, which you know. I'm not so sure about, but it is what it is. You know, I can't really fix it. Um, so anyway, I spent probably two two weeks in the hospital or so. Um, after that, uh, recovering, uh, gaining you know movement, gaining strength and such. And during that time, I'm on uh, IV Dilaudid and um, oxy syrup, um, like a lot. So. Um, because I was addicted to opiates already, they had right. to up the dose, obviously. So I, they were giving me a lot, and I was discharged. Um, I was given, you know, a huge script for uh, roxycodone um, tens. I was I was given uh, two. I think it was two hundred forty or two hundred sixty milligrams a day, um, just of the oxys. Uh, um, and this is when my opiate use kind of just was kicked into overdrive. You know, like I, um, I, I started uh, doing physical therapy, um, but I was also still uh, doing heroin. I, after I came home from the hospital, I had a neck brace on, you know, and I was, you know, I was obviously not in a good situation. I shouldn't have been going out and driving down to the hood and copping down there while I got a neck brace on. They said, you, you cannot drive because you can't, you know, move, you can't see behind you, stuff like that. So <clears throat> obviously that's that's just reckless, right? And I'm, I'm putting myself in danger, possibly others. Uh, but at that time, I'm not worried about that. You know, who cares about that? I need to get, I need to get this, I need to get this stuff. Um, so I, I end up doing, uh, I end up getting to about fifty to a hundred dollars a day of an H habit on top of those the prescribed oxys from the neck thing. However, um, about a month after the accident, so two weeks after I got out of the hospital, the doctor uh, wanted to get me off the oxys. 
So she starts uh, a taper, which um, really wasn't it's really wasn't weeks. much of a taper. <laughs> yeah. So well, it wasn't much of a taper. She cut uh, about 30 milligrams, I believe it was, every three days. So I was completely off the oxy within, you know, a <clears> week <throat> or so, you know, give or take. And that's that's obviously not enough when you're dependent to be taken down that fast it needs to be slower um, so basically they start talking to me about um, I go in for my checkups uh, for my neck from the surgeon and such um, you know while this taper is going on uh, they start talking to me about uh, ibuprofen uh, for pain which <laughs> I mean come on that's that's not gonna work um, and then they start saying, um, possibly they want me to switch to Suboxone or Methadone to handle my pain and my uh, addiction uh, to opiates. Um, so, of course, I, uh, I replaced that Oxy that she uh, took me down on with more heroin. So now I'm doing 100 to 200 dollars a day of heroin mixed in with uh, you know, Xanax, Valium. Basically anything else uh, I could find at that point that would help with the pain and, you know, just take me out of the situation that I was living in, basically. Eventually, in late 2013, um, October, I go to rehab for the first time. Uh, and after rehab, well, they get me on Suboxone in rehab. Um, I get, I get, I do the 30 days inpatient. Um, which was kind of miserable because I, you know, that was actually my 21st birthday, um, was in October. So I was basically in rehab for that, which kind of sucked, but, um, you know, it's, it's much better than, than jail. You know, there was girls in there there was, you know, you could watch right. TV, ha have a phone and such. So it wasn't the worst, but it just kind of sucked. It wasn't how I thought my 21st birthday would go. Um, what were you facing jail? Like, it, I mean, what facing jail for what? Were you busted or? No, 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 not at that point. Um, okay. I, well, we'll, we'll get to that if that's coming. All right. So, so this went on, um, this went on for probably, probably till mid 2014. Um, then I began to try, you know, stop taking the Suboxone and I was, and I was doing heroin again. And, um, that's when I, that's when I ended up catching my first charge. Um, shortly after that, basically, uh, I had a friend that ended up, uh, snitching on our mutual drug dealer. Um, he was my drug dealer, which I introduced my friend to, um, and he ends up getting caught for something he snitches on the drug dealer to get out of it and in that in all of that i am always coming and going from the guy's house and the police see that and one day um they're sitting there around the corner i pull off they follow me i get pulled over searched they say we know where you were we know what you were doing where's the drugs blah 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 <clears throat> so that was my first charge of uh, possession of narcotics, possession of paraphernalia. You know, not not too bad, but it was it was my first you know real serious brush with the law. I had gotten I had gotten in a little bit of trouble when I was uh, under eighteen for weed and stuff. Obviously, um, not serious, but those charges. Um, so I'm I'm in county jail. Uh, you know, miserable. Um, my parents uh, get me a lawyer, uh, so that was that was fifteen thousand dollars for a simple drug charge, which I think now that I look at it, that is insane. I should have paid maybe five yeah. k at most. Probably could have just gone with the public defender. Honestly, I should have, but I, it was my first, you know, real charge. I was scared, you know. I thought I yeah. need to get a good lawyer, so I got the best lawyer basically in town for this. Um, which was kind of stupid uh, looking back, but, you know, hindsight, yeah. you know, 2020 oh, and all know. that. 
My so, first lawyer I paid seventy five thousand dollars to. I paid seventy for to plead me guilty, to plead me out to a three year and I was never facing jail time. Like just I just was stupid and young and didn't know and I was scared right. and same just, same you know. scenario here. Right. So um fifteen K gets me a deferred prosecution agreement, which I could have got with the public defender anyway as my first <laughs> Is my first offense, right? So then I was back on the street. Um, they had me on like a year, basically, of probation. Uh, I had to do community service, you know, all that bullshit. Yeah. So I took that. I did take that seriously um, because I didn't want to go to jail, obviously, again. Um, so I remained sober for that until uh, 2015. And in June 2015 is uh my best friend had ended up od basically um and uh let's see we he was I, so i was just at the tail end of this dpa probably like a month left uh, my friend dies with this od it hit, hit me really hard um so, hey, I hung out with him every day. We went to school together. Uh, he was at that public school in high school. Um, so he ODs, uh, passes, leaves a um, you know, his young son at that time. He's probably four years old. Um, his his uh, his girlfriend, you know, the rest of his family and, and you know his friends. Um, so that kind of that kind of ended up with me going into a spiral of relapse and uh, destructive behavior. Um, I would I would be getting high. I would be going to uh, street races. I'd be running from the police um, purposefully. Um, that was one of the things that I just really uh, enjoyed doing. I would go out late at night, um, go out on the freeway, kind of uh, head north out of the city um, and just if I see a cop just drive by him get off the freeway flip around and then go drive by him at like 120. Um, so this is on a motorcycle to... I'm, I'm assuming you're on a no 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 in a car what are you driving uh I had two I had well I had three cars uh during that short during, during this time frame, basically, I had um, I had two Honda Civics. One of them was uh, basically fully built, uh, all motor car, um, and it made probably about two hundred seventy uh, horsepower, but it only weighed, you know, two thousand pounds. So this thing was basically a go kart, you know. Yeah. And and it was and it was fast, man. You know. 270 horsepower is anything nowadays, but back then, and with the the conditions and everything, it was it was a quick car. And so I would go, I would I would go blow by them at 100, 120 or whatever. I would kind of wait to see if they're gonna follow me because sometimes they just wouldn't, you know. They would just they would just keep sitting there and just let me go. Um, but the best times were when they would pull out. Um, obviously, as soon as I seen those lights my adrenaline went from from here to you know all the way up here um and that was on top of getting high i think that was probably one of the one of the best drugs that i ever had done basically was was the adrenaline rush from from running from the police because uh, after you do that when you get away you you have you're so pumped up for the next eight to 12 hours like you know you couldn't sleep it was just you know adrenaline coursing through your through your system uh, and then i also uh i had a subaru uh a subaru uh, D uh wrx sti um that was also fully built uh 600 horsepower big turbo all that um which i mean that was that was fun to to run from the cops in but i i really liked that car and i didn't want to fuck it up so you know honda civic is a honda civic but this car was it's basically um full full custom uh, everything right uh, body everything all that 
maybe I can, you know, get some pictures or something like that, and we can throw them up. Um, <clears throat> so, besides my street racing, doing drugs, um, and all that, I was, um, we'll go back a little bit. When I had first started dabbling, um, 20, back in, in uh, public high school, uh, junior or senior year, so 2010, 2011, I started uh, hearing about the dark net um, or the dark web, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> so um, I had I had ordered some some drugs from there uh, back then, you know, just here and there. I wasn't really into it, but fast forward, we're back to uh, you know the that time frame after my friend dies, I'm, I'm, I'm running 20, 2015, whatever. Um, so I get back on the dark web basically. And I think, um, this is, this is what I'm going to start doing. So I begin to, uh, get drugs off there. Um, basically ordering heroin, all, all the ones that I enjoy, basically, all the downers, um, and then I would um, get what, other drugs that I would sell. What forum is this? So there was a few. Um, there was uh, in the beginning, obviously, there was like Silk Road and stuff like that that I was on. Then we get to um, these Hans, Hansa Market. I mean, there was. There was a, a bunch of, of these marketplaces, basically. Um, and it's basically like eBay, right? For drugs and, right. and anything illegal. Um, so I begin to do that. And uh, I start. Obviously, it gets very expensive. So then I have to start figuring out ways, ways I can offset the money that I'm spending. I... Uh, I have a connection to a lab in China where I was getting, um, I was getting things, uh, for, for very cheap, um, like benzo, those, uh, uh, research chemicals. Um, not sure if you know anything about those. Um, they're basically, they're basically drugs that have, uh, haven't been used, um, approved for anything. Uh, they're basically, you know, made in a lab, someone makes some tweaks to a molecule and they come up with a different drug. So All right. So it's legal. For, for example, well, for it's, it's, it's sort of legal. For example, you have uh, Xanax, which is Alprazolam. Um, so an art, the, the, uh, one of the research chemical versions would be flu Alprazolam, basically, which is just a fluorinated version of Alprazolam. It's more uh, potent. Uh, last longer and stuff like that. So um, I'm getting these research chemicals and such from this lab in China. Um, I could get uh, the grams were $45. Um, and if I bought more, which I started doing, because um, at first I would buy two grams of you know this, two grams of that, two grams of this. And then I would take it, I would get it, repackage it, also... Um, uh, market it basically press press these into uh, press them into pills and then sell them on the dark net also locally you know here and there to people that I trusted um, so let me just say this off of, of you know forty five dollars for a gram of of one of these things um, which is basically about a thousand doses. So I would turn around and sell them for, you know, th basically three dollars a dose. So the profit margin is is pretty pretty big on that. Um, so I, I'm starting to get money from that. Everything's good, um, and this is when I start. Well, the fentanyl really comes into play here. So I have a, I have a um, question. A Where are you, sell, you're, you said you're reselling it. Some of it to people you yeah. know. And right. what are you doing with the, selling the rest of it on the for, on the forum? Yeah. So I mean, I was selling most of it on on the dark net on one of these. Okay. Yeah. 
things. So you're just a vendor. You're a vendor. You started. Yeah, I I, be, I started. I got a vendor account because at first I was just a buy. I just had a buying account, so I had to get verified to become a vendor. Basically, they right. you got to pay. Um, you got to pay a fee. Basically, they'll let you in. They'll they'll check you out. You got to, um, you know, do verification type things to become a vendor. So I become a vendor. I'm doing that, selling those RCs and stuff. And then, you know, that's that's when the fence. And then I do. Um, in, in between all that, I was doing little little stuff here and there to to support myself. Like uh, um, I would get credit card numbers. I would get accounts um, for you know bank accounts, uh, cryptocurrency account, Coinbase. You know. Um, basically any type of account, Netflix, and I was either reselling them or using them like to buy things or, or transferring the money, buying crypto with it. And then I would get, you know, transfer it to my own account then basically. I, I end up uh, finding a, a guy uh, down in Florida um, who was, who was getting, getting that stuff. I don't know where, probably China, but so that was my first one. Um, there was also a, a couple in, uh, in Canada that ran like a retail boutique type, uh, clothing store, but in the back is where they had their, their operation for their, their vendor on the dark net. So they were selling, um, you know, all kinds of stuff out there, but mostly fent. Um, there was also a guy down in Texas. And then later on, um, there was a guy in Wisconsin, um, just like an hour away. Um, so I've got, you know, multiple connections. So I'm getting different types of, of this from, from all these guys. They all got different types, uh, have analogs basically of, of the fact, um, I don't want to start listing off the names cause that's, um, you know, YouTube yeah. might take, take, you know, yeah, too many. They're already going to have a row. They're already going to have a problem, but they anyway, might. go ahead. Yeah. But so, so, so there's a lot of your, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So a lot of different stuff. Um, so basically I would take that, um, I would take that fent powder and I would, uh, make a solution. I would order about a um, hundred or two hundred of these, uh, like a nasal spray, um, you know, like a, you know, an empty nasal spray bottles off on Amazon, and then just a big jug of saline solution. I right. would make a big solution, a volumetric solution with this, uh, with the, um, you know, the stuff, and um, turn it into um, a nasal spray that, uh, you know, didn't look like it was drugs, right? It's just nasal right. spray, saline spray. And I even had uh, um, custom labels made up, my own labels that I put on it, um, you know, so it looked legit. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's, when, that's when it was big time, basically, when I started figuring out the nasal spray thing and I was doing that. What kind of money are you making with this? You know, it's hard to say because I, I was spending so much at the same time. Like I would, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't saving any money. So I would probably say, um, geez, probably, probably five, probably $5,000 a week in profit or so. Okay. Um, not bad. You know, and that, and that, yeah, that's okay. Right. Yeah. It's a decent but living. So you can it's a maintain lot. it. Yeah, if you can maintain it, which, which, which is the which is the problem, right? Exactly. Um, so, from 2016 to 2018, that's basically that was my main hustle. Um, was vending on the dark net, um, right? You know, also the you know, and then street racing, uh, a little bit of fraud here and there. I would very very early on, um, I found. Um, you know what 4chan is? That uh, sounds familiar. Message, message basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Message yeah. board, right? Um, on there, way back in the day, uh, people started uh, making these fake coupons 
for for things at, at um, like electronic stores and stuff like that. So I would get a coupon, um, basically, and it would uh, be for a brand new video game that just came out. You know, sixty dollars, eighty dollar game, and I get it for a dollar using this coupon. Um, Online or you go in the store? No, in this in the store, right in the store, okay. and see, and so the coupon isn't it's not legit obviously but the people running the register there are teenage kids you know i'm talking about you know get going to GameStop. you know you don't have you know super highly intelligent trained people work in the register there so they see right. the coupon they uh they try to scan it it doesn't scan through um they so override they just, it and they override it and they enter it in so i i'm getting these right. games for a dollar Brand new games that just came out. Um, also, uh, you know, coupons for for grocery stores. Load up a whole cart, meat, ribs, steaks, all that stuff. Get it for a couple bucks. Um, so little little you know nickel and dime stuff like that was uh, was going on kind of before I started the big dark net uh, vending. Right. Um, and then and then all that just seemed. Uh, well, some of it went away. The, the the coupon stuff obviously didn't last long. You had uh, homeless people that found out about it, and they were they were abusing it so so hard that um, there was actually like you know nationwide emails sent out to all these companies that you know about these coupons. They're not legit uh, and stuff like that. Yes, but so that didn't, it, Bo, that didn't Boziak, last long. John Boziak, yeah. Like when he was a kid and he was homeless, they used to make fake like Burger King and McDonald's gift certificates. He said he was like, you know, like you get one, you'd scan it. He said, and you know, it, it wouldn't. He said you go in there, even if it didn't scan. He said, you know, they just override it and give you the food. Like they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna, you know, call the cops over a, a ten dollar or five dollar gift certificate. You right. Know? So he said, you know, it, yeah, he was, they were basically abusing the it. Right. They were abusing it for years till eventually they'd come in. They just go like, no. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what happened. They uh, towards the end, you you would go in there with the coupon, and they would say, "No, we know what this is. Get out of here. Or I'm or I'm going to call the cops. Don't come back." We get to probably the 2016 to 2018 era, uh, which uh, which was the the big money making one. So during the end of that, towards the end, um, end of 2017, beginning of 2018 eventually packages begin to go missing. Um, weird things start happening. They're arriving late. Um, you know, obviously something's going on. And right then I should have known, uh, you know, that there was an investigation going on. I should have, you know, I should have cut bait and I should have just, I should have got out of there. Um, I probably could have, you know, got away at that point, uh, without being, being identified because, um, Basically, they were investigating a case um, where one of the one of those vendors, I believe it was the uh, the Canadian one, sent um, some of their some of their stuff to someone down in the United States. They ended up ODing, um, and they found uh, they found the evidence basically of of darknet transactions. They found the package that came in stuff like that so they knew uh that they were dealing with more than just you know uh some kid on the street that you know go go down to the hood and, and got some stuff and, and it would be right um so they uh a task force has started um with uh the fbi the usps postmaster um uh, local, you know, sheriffs, local government, you know, local, local, local law enforcement, all of them. They start this, they start this huge um, operation to take down all these uh, fentanyl dealers and stuff like that. <clears throat> 2018 is when, um, beginning of 2018, I believe it was February or March. Uh, is when my door gets kicked in, um, and I was, it was, it was. They didn't knock on the door, and no, 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 
they didn't uh, knock well, on the door. No, they they, they did. They they did. Actually, they did because I, I was I was sleeping at the time, so I didn't answer. So they're 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 at the door. They're all surrounding the house. There's probably you know 20, 25 of these cops um, all down the block, surrounding every street. You know. Um, because they didn't know what to expect. But what they did know is that I um, they had circumstantial evidence at that point that I was one of these people involved in this operation, um, which they weren't wrong. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I end up um, getting my – the door gets kicked in. Um, they, I hear this. I'm actually sleeping at the time. Now, now most raids happen, you know, people say four in the morning, whatever, when people are sleeping. This happened at like 1030 in the, in the, in the morning. Um, but I was expecting a package that day. I know the mail doesn't come until 12, one o'clock. So I, I wasn't too concerned. So I was just, you know, hanging out. I was sleeping, um, just waiting for the package to get there. Um, so uh let's see i let me let me rewind um there was a, a package that came probably two or three days before that um it wasn't the normal mail guy for one for two he didn't just leave it in the mailbox he came up to the door and asked for a signature for it that's another thing that i should have knew that something was going on because this package didn't require a signature and, uh, you know, obviously I find out that wasn't actually a, uh, you know, a post of a mailman, you know, no. it was, uh, it was a US, it was a USPS, uh, a federal inspector. Um, so <laughs> yeah, not good. I end up with, uh, from that, um, I end up with about 18 felonies, um, for, uh, possession of, of all these substances for uh, conspiracy to distribute, conspiracy to to, to get it. Um, and there was a couple misdemeanors, too, in there as well. Where are you living at this time? So at, at the time my door gets kicked in, um, I was living in uh, was living in Milwaukee. I'm um, sorry, were you living with your and, family, with your parents, or...? No, no, not at okay. that time. So, okay. um, so I get these charges, um, 18 felonies, a bunch of uh, misdemeanors, um, and I and I, I think I'm fucked, you know. But the good thing is, is that when I heard that door get kicked in, I jumped out of my bed. I knew as immediately that it was the police. I jump out of my bed. I run over. I kick my computer off. Basically, I just kick the damn thing, and it ends up turning, you know, turning off um, and locking. Basically, you know, it was everything uh, was encrypted on my computer. If it wasn't already open, you're not going to get on it unless you have the uh, the keys, the password, all that. So they weren't able to get into my computer, which uh, saved me from a lot of the charges. Um, I can uh, I can look at um, some of the charges here on um, on the court uh, documents. Um, there was there was everything from um, well, I think I already said uh, basically all the charges. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting a little I'm getting a little lost here. Uh, it's all right. So you, so, you, they grabbed you. Yeah, they, this is the, they, this is basically the first time I'm telling, I'm telling any of this story. Um, right. Publicly, you know, except for people that, that know me and stuff like that. Um, so I'm in County jail. Well, uh, let me rewind. So they, they raid the house. They get me out, uh, you know, put me in the car. Um, they're, they're searching the house. They go through everything. They end up, um, one of the cops actually ends up stealing from one of my uh, roommates. Um, in, no. in his room, he had a thousand dollars. He had a thousand dollars in a Bible that it, that was like his his emergency money. You know, if something comes up. Right. So they they go in there and they you know they tear apart everyone everyone's shit. You know, when really they should have they should have just tore apart my stuff and maybe the community. You know, living room, bathroom, stuff like that. 
um, but they didn't. They go through the whole house. They steal a thousand dollars from my roommate uh, out of a Bible. <laughs> how, uh, how how great is that? You know, police protecting and serving um, and stealing. Well, that happens. They're they're pe- they're regular yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm sitting out in the car. They're they're going through the house. You know, they're fine. They, the more they're, the longer they're in there, they're bringing out more and more and more stuff. You know, um, so that's when the detectives approach me and say, "Hey, what do you want to do about this?" Basically, you know, do you want to talk to us or or what? And I say, "No, not right now." I'm, I'm not, you know, in a good state of mind at that point because I, you know, I was still doing drugs and I was, I didn't do any before that. Uh, so I wasn't feeling good at that time. And I just, I said, just take me to jail, you know, get me to the cell. Let me get, get me in front of the judge and let's get this figured out. But I'm not talking to you about any of this stuff. You know, you do what you got to do. Uh, so in County jail, um, uh, Basically, you know, you're supposed to get in front of a judge uh, within two, within 48 to 72 hours here, I believe it is. Um, but during that time, uh, I was coming off all those drugs. I ended up having uh, seizures, um, which led to uh, aspiration pneumonia um, from uh, basically I was puking so violently and so often that I ended up inhaling my own puke and that caused an infection in my lungs. Um, also getting rhabdomyolysis, which is basically your, um, your muscles break down, uh, your muscle fibers end up get, uh, getting in your bloodstream, um, uh, you know, your whole body and, and, the, and your body isn't uh, made to process all that. So that's why um, you get kidney failure and stuff. Because um, you get these, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to explain, but basically, muscle fibers can't be uh, they can't be processed, you know. So it backs up your system. So I'm in the um, in the jail, uh, seizing um, all this other stuff uh, for about two two days. So that's when um, they basically call medical. Medical comes in, they say, you need to get this kid to the hospital um, or he's going to die, basically. So they uh, transport me. I go to the hospital. Um, they they diagnose me with all that stuff that I said. And um, basically, I, they couldn't talk to me, obviously, at that point. Um, so I was actually put into a uh, three-day induced medical coma while they figured out what was going on, testing my blood, all that. Um, so at that, at that time, um, I had, you know, I'd been obviously handcuffed to, to that bed um, for about 14 days. I think it was actually 12. It's almost two weeks I'm, in, I'm handcuffed to this bed. Um, you know, I couldn't move. I was getting weaker. Um, I... I was trying to get over this this rhabdomyolysis, and I, you know, I was I was peeing. Uh, it was uh, brown. It was like orange brown, and um, so I was in basically kidney failure at that point. It was was about, I was on the edge of needing needing dialysis, basically, if if we couldn't get it sorted quick enough. Um, so that's why I was in the hospital for so long. Uh, so they. Um, they get me on a few medications to stop from the seizures and all that. Um, I, so they end up taking me back. I missed my court date because of all this. Obviously, I was they couldn't take me to court when I was having seizures. Right. Um, so I get back. They say, uh, I, I say, you know, when am I going to see the judge? Um, obviously, the CEOs in there they don't they don't give a shit. They don't know. Uh, well, they do know. They could look up in the computer but they don't. Um, so eventually about a week goes by and they say, Hey, listen, you, uh, you got court in the morning. Um, so I go, I go to court, 
um, in custody uh, in front of the judge. Um, and dur during this time, uh, let me back up, my parents, they didn't know where I was or what was going on, obviously. Um, my house was uh, taped up. I was gone. Um, there was no record of me um, uh, in the hospital because I was in custody. Um, so my parents had no idea where I was. Um, and they, they end up finding out I don't know how my dad finds out. I, um, I think he went to the jail or he went to the hospital and he actually seen me at the hospital. Um, and then uh, they end up getting me a lawyer. I get in front of the judge. I mean, that was another that was another 20K for the lawyer. Um, and I get in front of the judge. I was offered, uh, I was offered a plea for... Uh, five and a half years in to out. Um, uh, and I held out for oh, probably, I held out for like a week or two, uh, trying to trying to get a better deal, trying to talk to the lawyer, to talk to the DA and stuff like that, you know, you know, uh, to, you know, trying to get them to take into account, you know, all the medical stuff and all that. Um, <clears throat> So eventually I take that plea because otherwise I would have gone to trial and I probably would have got smoked. I mean, I absolutely just smoked for like 10, 15 years at least, I would bet. Um, right. Because at that time, um, you know, that's when the, the crisis was, was just really starting to hit the mainstream. So I would have been made a huge, I would have been just you know, a huge huge win for the for the county and the state and, and everyone basically um if, if they get this conviction um and and you know they can put in their uh in the in the news you know they stopped a, a drug dealer you know that was dealing uh, right, right in your neighborhood right next to your kids putting uh, everyone in danger by having this stuff shipped in the mail you know it, something could happen and, and someone comes in contact with uh, what's inside the package and you know that first of all it's never going to happen unless someone tries to get into the package these, these packages are double vacuum sealed inside an x-ray proof bag inside another plastic bag and then put into you know the shipping container so anyway you know i digress um so anyway i took this plea um five and a half years basically um so um you know back to county jail and i and i wait for the prison uh for the prison transport which came a few weeks later um and i was off to uh me and a, me and a few other folks who were off for a nice drive to dodge correctional institution which is uh basically the classification place that they take you um but it's also uh, basically like a maximum security prison, uh, state maximum. Um, so they had a few units for classification. Well, this is, what do you mean this is state? Yeah, they had me in a state prison. So the reason, um, the reason it gets uh, basically, um, I get charged by the state was because the um, federal authorities, basically the, the United States postmaster and stuff like that, um, they couldn't prove that I was one um, that I was selling this stuff because I had uh, knocked my computer over. It went off. They couldn't get into it. So there's no record that way. However, um, they had before I got arrested, there was an investigation going on um, because they knew someone in that area was shipping things out. Um, because they were finding these packages all over the country and they would trace them back to the area where they were shipped. Like, you know, they can do that. You know, they can see exactly yeah. what, what, uh, what USPS box a package was dropped off into, um, and stamped and all that. So they knew someone in the area was doing this at that time. So, so basically, you know, they had all this circumstantial stuff, but they didn't have that smoking gun, um, basically, which was my computer, um, so, 
so they so they weren't able to so basically they handed off or well i guess they didn't really hand it off because the state was involved the whole time as well right um, it's, a, it's a task said, force yeah it, it was a full it was a full task force um so let's see i was i was in this uh dodge correctional um for uh, two and a half months uh, being classified, you know, they go through the gauntlet of, of medical, dental, vision, you know, they do all that bullshit, um, you know, to, to make sure everything is, uh, to make sure you're not going to die or, you know, you're not physically disabled in some way and they don't know about it. Um, so in in those classification units, you're, you're in your cell uh, 24-7 except for going to that medical appointment or, or whatever, um, which, you know, so it's, it's trays in your cell. Um, you get out two times a week, maybe three to take a shower. Um, once you get out of the the fir first phase, yeah, when you, the phone, uh, rec, once you get out of the first phase, you can get out um, an hour for rec. I think it was like three times a week, um, which... Uh, you know, I was, I, I was happy, um, that, you know, I could get a little bit of, of, of sunlight because I had been in the county jail and stuff like that, you know, with no wreck, no outside, no, no fresh air, nothing. Um, so, so that was, that was good, but it was still, you know, it, it wasn't the best uh, situation. You know. yeah, so I get out of the classification. Trying to make you happy. No, they're not trying they're to make good. you happy. It's they're definitely not concerned about healthy. your comfort. <laughs> yeah. Are you happy? Is everything okay? Right, but you, they do do room service though. So they do. Um, they do. There's security. Anyway, yeah, security and room service. That's basically all you get there. Um, so um, I get out of the classification unit um, about two and a half months. Um, I go to one of the other units, which is on the other side of the prison, which is basically where they, where they house inmates that are already sentenced. Um, and they were sentenced to do their time at Dodge because it's also a prison, not just a classification. Um, so that's I'm on one of those you, units. That's not, where, all, that's not where you were sentenced though. You weren't going to do your time there. No. Okay. No, I was I, I was ended, I was waiting for my transport uh, eventually, uh, which would come. Uh, so, I mean, I'm in the normal housing units where you can actually get out. Um, you know, out of, you can get out of your cell for a few hours at a time. There's there's one TV, there's phones, you know, stuff like that. It's much better than being in your cell twenty four seven, obviously. Um. So. Let's see. And that, um, that's actually where, uh, in Dodge is actually where I learned, uh, where I learned how to fish. Um, cause basically, you know, you're in these cells and, you know, it's the guy next to you in, in the other cell over has something that you want or you want a tray or something like that. So, um, to anyone watching, if you know what fishing is, it's not with a rod and a hook, uh, on a lake. Um, it is uh, a bar of soap, soap that's carved say. into a hook. Yep, yep. A bar of soap and you, and carved you, into like a hook. String. Right. You can do, yeah, there's a few things you can do uh, for, for your string, basically. You could do elastic um, if you want to be able to kind of, you take it and kind of fling it and get it towards, you know, something and catch it. Or, or you do like a long... Uh, uh, you pull apart one of your state um, things and you've got, um, you know, a, a, like just basically a thread. Um, so that's where I learned uh, about that, which I, kind of blew my mind um, because, I, you know, I had never been in prison. I didn't know anything about that at the time. So yeah, you know, my cell, he taught amazing. me how to, how to do that. Yeah, he, he taught amazing. me, you know, a lot of things um, that I had no idea I would need uh, for the upcoming, you know, couple years. Um, so after 
I'm in, I'm in that dodge for, uh, you know, a few months. I get transferred finally um, to uh, Stanley Correctional, which is, which is only about, I would say, a four, four and a half hour drive straight from Dodge to Stanley. Um, but you've got a whole bus of guys that got to get dropped off at other prisons on the way. So you're, you're on this bus, you know, hands and feet shackled. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a toilet in the back that you gotta, I mean, there's, how are you going really going to use the toilet, uh, when you're like that? Mm. Right. So, so it smelled like piss, you know, the, the floor is wet, uh, just nasty. So you're on this bus, I'm on this bus uh, for about eight and a half hours, uh, just to go four hours away because we had to stop at, uh, uh, let people off in like New Lisbon, Fox Lake. I remember um, Wapon. We dropped a couple guys off at uh, um, Oxford, um, which is a fed uh, federal place. I don't know if you know about that. Uh, um, that uh, actually uh, Ryan Leone uh, spent time at Oxford um, here in Wisconsin. Who's just that? A quick fact. You don't know who Ryan Leone is? No. He is um, basically, you know, he was he was a drug addict and uh, he went to prison, uh, did, did time, whatever came out, and he was a really funny, uh, a guy that you could people could relate to, and that would make you laugh. So he started a YouTube channel. Um, so you can look that up, and he has, uh, you know, all these stories on here from is using his prison and all that. And um, it's very, it's, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, you should definitely check it out. Um, okay. So, so he's a YouTuber. Yeah. He, he ended up uh, doing YouTube. However, um, he actually passed away uh, last year, I believe. Like a couple months ago, actually. Yeah. He was, he was clean. He was with, uh, he was with his girl. You know, everything was good. He was, he had his kid back. Um, he was living, um, on his own, um, and everything was good, but he, he had a relapse and he ended up dying, which is unfortunate, you know, but that's what happens. Um, that's what comes with the territory. Um, so we drop all these guys off at these, at these prisons on the way. And I finally get to, uh, Stanley, which is a medium. Um, and this is where I spend most of my sentence. Um, so I get there probably at 11, 1130. Uh, I, I finally get through R and D and the intake and I get on the unit at like 1130 after, after everyone's locked in, you know, uh, they tell me which cell to go to. And, uh, and that's where I, and that's where I, uh, did time for, um, about a year. I think it was about 10 months, 11 months at Stanley. No, it was a little over a year. I'm sorry. It's a little over a year. Um, I was at Stanley. Um, and then that's when, uh, so obviously I had a drug problem and that was documented and the judge allowed, um, or put in, put in the paperwork that I could do the, uh, ERP program, which is basically, uh, earned release, which is kind of like the same thing as your, uh, what is it called? RDAP. RDAP. Yeah, it's basically RDAP. Um, uh, at this uh, at this place called Chippewa, so I get transferred from Stanley to Chippewa, which is which is not far. Um, it's only about fifteen minutes away. So they just take you in a van. You get there, and this Chippewa place is is compared to where I was, it was sweet. It 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 did feel like uh, it did feel mm. like a five star hotel compared to where I just was. Um, it was a secured minimum. So there was fences um, and everything, but um, there was there was open movement. Um, so you could come and go from the yard um, anytime that, uh, basically from eight till, till lunch, after lunch till dinner, and after dinner for a couple right. hours. You could go out on the yard. Um, you could sneak to other units. Uh, you know, do your thing. Like you know, 
if you're if you're making moves. Yeah, exactly. Um, so at that Chippewa place, I was I was given a bed date, which is basically a start date for your program. Your programming you got to that you got to finish to get out. Uh, you do this program for six months, and you get a year knocked off your sentence. Nice. Um, right. Yeah. So I mean, I and I needed. I thought I needed that. You know. So, um, I spent um, nine months waiting for my bed day um, to start this program. So during that nine months, I'm you know just doing time, figuring out the routine at the new uh, institution because you know you got to get into a routine when you get locked up or, or you're or you're just you're making time worse on yourself. So I get a routine going. Um, I start making some you know, some friends there. Um, and I, I end up, um, running into a guy that's actually from Milwaukee as well. Um, a black guy, uh, he had, um, sickle cell anemia. Um, and he also had uh, a few, a few other, um, medical issues that, uh, basically he was, um, he was given oxycodone, uh, 20 milligram pills, two of them, um, four times a day. Hmm. So I get in, uh, I get in with this guy. Um, you know, I'm not, I haven't started my program yet, you know, so I figure, fuck it. I'll, uh, I'll mess around. Um, so I start getting, you know, these oxys from him and I'm, and I'm doing my thing now in prison. They drug test you randomly. And especially at these at these lower ones, especially these ones where there's uh, the drug treatment place. And uh, so I'm doing these these oxys and stuff. And eventually uh, I get in the middle of the night. They come and they say, hey, we need to uh, take you for a drug test. Uh, they um, they take me out of the cell. I say, OK, I'll go to the bathroom. I try to. Um, I try to stall a little bit because before I had left the cell, I, I, I woke up my buddy who was in the bunk behind me because these are, um, these are 10 man cells. Um, there's four 10 man cells per unit. And then there's a few, uh, two man cells for the workers. Um, so I tell my friend, Hey, I, I need you to uh, help me out here. So, cause we have talked about this in case uh, I get a drug test. I need you to pee. So he had this little container that he um, that he was saving in case this happened. And it did twice, actually. Um, so I uh, I wait for him to. I basically tell the cops I can't pee. I need some water, whatever. They say okay. Go sit in the servery, drink water in there, and then let us know when you got to go. They wouldn't let me back onto the unit, obviously. So they locked me in the servery. Um, however, uh, there's a window, um, to the unit from the servery. So I see my buddy go to the bathroom. He comes out, he looks at me, gives me, you know, gives me a nod. I say uh, to the cops, um, I'm ready. Go back in there, um, at the, you know, behind the urinal, there's this little, uh, little cup. I dump that in there. I take a piss in the urinal. I flush it. I give it to him and I'm good. So there was a lot of things like that uh you know things you say that, that would things never going on in that place that, that would never fly in, in coleman they took you in a special room and the cops stood in there with you and just and watched you pee oh he oh they 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 were watching me but um right the way that the bathroom was set up it, it like they couldn't be right next to me they were kind of standing behind me um Right. So they couldn't really see. They couldn't see exactly what was going on, but you know, they obviously, um, they they could catch people doing you know stuff um, if the if the person isn't smart enough or you know doesn't have doesn't have the right setup. Um, let's see, so um, I passed that drug test, which is the one that they give you right before you start your programming. Um, it was about a month before on my bed date. Uh, so I passed that. I get into the programming, um, and this is kind of um, this is kind of where I start to uh, 
realize that I need to stop doing this stuff or I'm going to get caught in here and I'm going to have to do the rest of my time in a medium. Um, you know, because this place is sweet. I wanted to stay there and I wanted to, you know, finish out my time uh, there. Yeah, that's how I, uh, that's how I felt about our app. I like definitely wanted to be there. Like, like, yeah, like I, that wanted, that, was I wanted to be unit. there. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was nice. Um, I wanted to be there, but at the same time, there were things uh, there that, you know, were not good. Uh, obviously, you got um, people going through the program and they're snitching on people to yeah. uh, get get rewards and points that uh, you could use these points to, um, you know, uh, to get a late night, uh, to be able to play a Frisbee golf out on the yard. Um because uh, they had frisbee golf, uh, they had like the the goals, right? But um, they wouldn't set them out in the yard for um, just anyone. They only set them out for for people that made these points. So it was like you know, it was something special. So if people wanted to do it. You know, you tell on someone, get some points, and you could play frisbee golf one day. You know, which you know. Would you know it's nice. I, I like frisbee golf and I would do it on the outside all the time, but that didn't mean that I was going to start telling on people in order to play frisbee golf in prison, right? Uh, it, it's it's just, amazing when you have everything taken away from you, what what raises up to the um, you know, to to be like a goal, like, like what's what's important, like what's like. They actually can hold that out. Something on the street that you'd be like, I don't give a shit. But in there, you have so you have nothing. So that's like a big deal. Oh yeah. Like getting getting to go to like the movie room and watch movies. They had movies you could watch. It was like, wow, I can go watch yeah. a movie. It's like it's yeah. just now you look at it and you go, that's stupid. Like like who cares? Well, listen, you got nothing. That stuff ends up being an incentive, right? Which is you know <laughs> fucked up, but. Yeah, so I mean, and that's the way that they that they would weed out people that you know, that didn't want to they that they didn't want to be in the program, right? So you know, people were getting told on for all kinds of stupid things. I mean, um, just dumb stuff. Okay, we'll just leave right, it at yeah. that. Um, so. I'm in the program, and um, so I, like I said, I start to realize I need to stop fucking around in there, and I need to take this seriously. Um, so for the most part, I clean up everything. However, the the one thing that I really was doing in there was um, I was tutoring for GED, um, and eventually, some of the the people realized that um, you know I was good with computers, obviously. And that, that's another thing, like I, we, we had discussed on the phone when I had got to prison. Uh, first off, they, you know, they ask you for your paperwork, your celly or, or people there. And, um, and I said, you know, they said, why are you here? I said, oh, well, drug stuff. And, 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 you know, it was some computer stuff. And that's obviously the wrong thing to say in prison. Right. Because uh, they, 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 think the, they, have they think you're pictures of underage. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So kids stuff and, and, and that wasn't the case. So I had to get my paperwork and show them that it was it was dark. Well, you know, fraud, uh, drugs, uh, stuff like that, that, that end up getting me caught. Um, so let's see, let's go back. Uh, we're, we're, we're before I got on that uh, little little rant rant. You were waiting for talking. the bed space. You, you, you wanted to stay in the program and you realized that you needed to clean up your act or you were going to end up having to spend the rest of your time in a medium. You didn't want to do that. Yeah. So, so I do that. So I'm doing, I'm not, I'm not doing the drugs anymore. Actually, uh, one of the reasons is because that dude ended up getting told on, um, and he, uh, get kicked out of the program. He, he, only, he was like in the last phase. He had like three months to get out. And he got kicked out because he had his he had his girl. Uh, he got on the phone. He talks to his girl. He tells his girl to call up up here, um, and and uh, I don't know what he was complaining about, but it was something to do with his um, the way he was being treated for his medical issues. Um, and whatever he said uh, was illegal, 
um, to, to be talking about or to be requesting someone to do um, in prison. So he, he goes, so that's just that, you know, that probably helped me out a little bit because um, the, the access was no longer there for that. And, and there was other stuff floating around. There was tobacco. There was there was a little bit of, of dope and, and stuff that would that would get in there because, like I said, it was a, it was a minimum. It was, it was secured, but there was only a fence. And right on uh, there was from the edge of the fence, there was actually just a, an open field, um, probably 50, 50 yards or so. And then it was trees. And there was actually guys that had, um, uh, you know, like potato launchers and stuff like that. Yeah. They would they would have their people come put a cut open a tennis ball, stuff it with drugs, uh, stuff it with, you know, whatever they wanted to get in. Um, and then they would fire that thing into the yard, the tennis ball um, at night. And you would come out in the morning and uh, most of the time uh the balls would be there sometimes this because the ceos would would rock the yard before yeah. opening they check the yard before uh before they let you out um so so you would have lazy ceos um and they would just say oh it's just a tennis ball you know someone left it out here and they would just leave it sometimes yeah they would pick it up and they would either throw it away or um, throw it back in the rec supply area so you would have to go dig through a bunch of tennis balls and uh, try to find this ball that's been cut open. But, you know, it was put back together in a way that you couldn't blatantly see. You would have to kind of feel it in your in your hand uh, compared to the other balls. Um, and, the, and they were doing things like that. I, and I wasn't involved in anything like that um, because because I wanted to get out. I mean, these were the people that were doing this were, were guys that. Um, they've been in and out of prison and that's basically their life. Um, so I'm in this program, um, about, let's say two, two months into the program or so. Um, I, ha I have an issue with, uh, this guy, um, uh, this guy BD. Okay. It's a little, little short, uh, black guy, but he was built, you know, he was, he was tough muscles, you know, um, and he had a problem with me because uh, that morning uh, for breakfast, um, it was hard boiled egg day. Uh, and I had, I had a deal with the servery worker to save me a spot in the second line. Basically, once you go through, grab your tray, you can go back in line. If there's extras, you can get an extra. So I was first in line for that second tray so I could get more than more than two hard boiled eggs right um and he had a problem with the, with that the fact that i um got a tray and he didn't because he felt you know entitled um or whatever and, you know it's stupid in there uh the things that you know people's you know setting towels on seats saving seats in the day room you know and, and, and that's that's generally respected by most people in there because that's how it works. Um, but for some reason, he just didn't like it. And uh, he comes, I'm, I'm actually back at my bunk at the time. And he comes into the cell and he's like, hey, man, I don't know where the fuck you're from. But, you know, where I'm from, you man, motherfucker, motherfucker gets stabbed up, blah, blah, blah. You know, you ain't going to be doing that shit. That's not how we work around here. And I'm like, dude, you just got here, you know, two months ago. I've been doing this for the last year, you know, um, at this place. Um, so I'm like, all right, dude, well, you know, just piss off. You know, basically I say, I'm not, I'm not trying to get in this argument, you know, go get out of here. Um, so he was, so he was heated and I, and I honestly, I was a little worked up too. Um, and later, uh, that day, um, like I said, everyone gets a routine in prison. Later that day, I uh, do my program. I go out on the yard. I'm, you know, playing uh, playing games out there, um, walking the track. And I come back in. I go to take my shower, which I would take every every afternoon between like two and four, um, before like the four thirty count. I would take my uh, shower. And what he did is. 
him and another guy um, plotted uh, to basically fuck me up. Uh, basically, when I when I went to the shower that day, um, so he's sitting in the um, in the shower room with a the mop bucket ringer, the handle to it. Um, so it's basically you know a metal handle and then the big plastic uh, thing that squeezes the mop. And he's right. got that in his hand, and he's got the other guy sitting outside of the shower room, uh, you know, waiting to sing, signal that I'm the one coming in there. So I walk in the shower room. Completely and this unexpected. is in the this is in the drug program. Yes, in the in the minimum uh, in the drug program, um, it's called ERP. You, you know, it's basically just a cognitive behavioral thing. It's very little to do with drugs, mostly to do with criminal thinking and and fixing, right. you know, all that. So, and he wasn't in the program yet. Um, so I, you know, he doesn't sound like program material. Right. And, and he's not, <laughs> he's actually, he's actually back in prison right now. Um, he got out and he was, and he's back in already. So that, that'll tell you everything you need to know. So I'm going to the shower that day. I take about one step into the shower room and out of the corner of my eye, I see something coming at me and it hits me right across the face. Oh, knocks shit. one knocks one of my teeth out cracks another tooth next to it i get uh my this eyebrow this eyebrow this fucking thing is backwards on here my left eyebrow um it got cut open real bad oh, i thought now, you were going to tell me you i thought you were going to tell me that you didn't that you you that he, he didn't attack or you figured found out saw something i didn't realize you it got an attack okay so you, no, you got hit no, he, he hit me with this mop bucket ringer so hard, it, it cracked a tooth, uh, shattered another one right out of my mouth. Um, and then uh, I get this cut on my eye. And the cut was, uh, at the time, that was the worst. Um, because what? how do I explain this this uh, cut that I got that's, you know, uh, it's this long, you know, right on my eyebrow. Um, so later... Uh, Basically, he does this to me, you know, tries to, you know, tries to scare me, talks a bunch of shit, says, don't do this shit again, or it's going to be worse next time. So I'm like, all right, whatever, dude, like, you know, this is kind of, this is some pussy ass shit, you know, I'm not trying to deal with it, basically. Um, but I do have to deal with it because now I'm, I got blood running down my face and I'm not going to go to the cops and say this guy just hit me with a mop handle because then they're going to investigate not only him, but me. And possibly anyone else that was involved or near the incident, and I didn't want anything to do with, with that. So, basically, I cover it up. I'm, uh, I'm just trying to hide basically what happened uh, from from the CEOs when they come through for count uh, that afternoon. Would you get um, thrown in the shoe? Would you guys both be thrown in the shoe? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Were they called the and, shoe there? Yeah. They uh the shoe the hole whatever but they actually yeah. don't have a hole at uh at the Chippewa place they actually send you back to Stanley like I said it's only ten minutes away so the hole is actually in Stanley right at the medium so you know they they'll they'll pack you up you know well you, you know basically um <clears throat> uh let's see. So you 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 have to hide this from the COs. I've got to hide because yeah, because we've got count at four thirty, and they come through right, and, I've, and I'm bleeding from the face. So I'm basically trying to hide this um, through count um, until after until I can get out um, get out on the yard after dinner, basically. Um, so I get out on the yard after dinner, and I uh, I basically uh, make sure that there's people around that see. And I basically do a face plant um, when I'm when I'm you know running, uh, working out out on the track, and I basically this face plant I come up I'm, I'm out of my head and whatever. Uh, the COs uh, see it. They got like a they got like a small watchtower on one side, and then they've got one on the other side, um, and then they've got the COs that um, are patting people down coming in and out and stuff like that by the door. And they see this happen, and I and I come out, I get up, and I'm like, oh no, and and, and the worst part was, I actually, from the from the fake fall, 
I actually ended up breaking two of my fingers. <laughs> so not only not only that, but now I got two broken fingers. Um, so I go, I go to the CEO. I'm like, oh, I, I need help. I, I think I fucked up my, you know, I cracked my head open and my and my finger hurts. Like like it was it was it was like sideways. It was probably like you know sticking off to the side. <laughs> Okay. And, and, and I, you know, and I did that to myself. So I, you know, it is what it is. Um, so I go to the CEO. I say, Hey, I need to, I need to go to medical, uh, go to medical. They say, ah, oh, this is, this cut is bad. You know, um, it's going to need stitches. And they say, well, how did this happen? I say, well, I, I fell out on the yard and, and I took a face plant while I was coming up the hill, uh, right into the, uh, to the asphalt walking path. Um, so they say you need stitches they don't do it there so i gotta go to the hospital get these stitches get my uh get my finger uh set um get the splint on that and uh and get taken care of there which um was was actually quite pleasant uh because i was um from there they actually because it's a minimum and stuff they actually don't they don't even cuff you um right they take you, they just take you in the van to the hospital. You walk in like any other person. Um, and I was there for probably like six hours. Um, I got some soda, you know, I got some nice food. I got to watch TV that I could control, uh, you know, nobody else around. It was, it was mostly quiet. It was quiet compared to where I was. So, you know, that was a little reprieve for a few hours. Um, so I got stitched up, got my finger taken care of, um, and then, back to uh, Chippewa I go so I get back um, and this and this dude uh, that did this he's worried he, he at this time he thinks I told on him he, he thinks something's gonna happen to him and stuff so he comes to me and he says hey what the fuck's going on you know like did you, know, did you tell or what and I said no dude I, I made up a story about falling out in the yard um, so, so after that, he has uh, enough respect for me for not telling him that he doesn't fuck with me for the rest of the time that I'm there, um, which is kind of it's kind of dumb that you know you got to do something like that in order to get you know an ounce of respect in there. Um, so basically, um, I get back to Chippewa. Um, I've got a you know broken finger, um, stitches and stuff. Um, I'm still in the program at this time, um, probably three months, uh, left, um, maybe three and a half months left or so. Um, I, I get there, I, I get back, I, I get back into my routine. Um, I'm doing the, uh, GED tutoring. And like I said, they found out, um, well, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, they found out about the computer stuff, obviously, pretty early. Um, but then uh, we get to go down to the library at this minimum where they actually have uh, a few computers um, that obviously aren't connected to the Internet or anything like that. They just have basic things like Microsoft Word, um, you know, so you can make a resume or, or um, they've got you can watch TED Talks. Um, that's all on there. Um, but it's all old. It's all real old. Um, so I start. Uh, I started teaching, uh, like basically a computer uh, class, um, like twice a week. We would uh, go down there, and I'll teach them how to do basic things on the computer, you know, real basic stuff. Um, but after a little while, the COs started. Uh, they they weren't monitoring us anymore. They just let the librarian, right. and that's when I started teaching them about the dark web. Because uh, everybody knew, and they and they were they wanted to get involved basically. And I'm like, listen, guys, I'm here because of this. <laughs> mm. Why why do you want to get involved in this? Because I'm you know, this is I'm in the same place you are. You're just gonna come back if you get into this, you know. But hey, I'm doing it because uh, you know they were paying me, you know, coffee, soups, whatever, to teach them all this stuff about the dark web and and so they could get out and get back to action. Um, <clears throat> so I'm doing that. I'm uh, through through the program, like I said. Um, 
uh, I cleaned up my act mostly um, besides that. And I get I graduate the program in um, mid-2020. So I was in, in prison in this medium for when COVID started. Um, so I got to experience that, which was, which was fun. And then I get, um, I get done with the program. They say, okay, your release date was moved down, you know, um, uh, I'm like, cool. So uh, I go back to my cell, a couple days go by. Um, I end up getting called in by the counselor. He says, uh, we got an, we got an email from Madison, which is, uh, the state, um, that, you know, that runs basically all the prison stuff, of the central office, right? That inmates that have completed the program that are waiting on a release date, um, they'll get paroled early. Um, as long as they, um, there was, there was factors to it that they, that you know, they didn't just let anyone out that completed the program. Um, you had to have a, a solid place to stay. They weren't accepting halfway house because of COVID, um, all this stuff. So I got lucky. Um, I ended up uh, getting out and I tell, you know, I tell them I'm going to stay with my parents. Um, I've got a ride. I've got, you know, everything I need. And they say, all right, we'll uh, email them back and, and tell them. So another couple of days go by, they call me up and say, hey, um, you're going to be getting out in, in a couple of weeks. Nice. Instead of instead of doing a, another, what, probably year, year and a half or so. Um, so I get out um, and uh, and basically, uh, you know, I was doing well when I got out. Um, you know, uh, that was mid, late 2020, um, and uh, and now I'm just trying to I'm just working on rebuilding uh, my life and you know trying to trying to do do it right. What are you doing now for work? Um, so I'm doing uh, programming, um, a little bit of coding for uh, uh, basically World of Warcraft uh, hacks for a game yeah <laughs> is it as, as as a job yeah so people i've got uh, i've got like 60 uh 60 70 uh clients customers right now every month that pay for access to this script basically that you know allows them to uh, do things in the game uh when they're not there or to do things that they can't do because they suck at the game basically Okay. You know, it's a hack. It, it it helps it helps them out. It's you know, it's a whole uh, it's a whole other story uh, with the coding and stuff. Um, so um, yeah, I'm just I'm just doing this programming stuff. Uh, I I want to uh, get some type of uh, job outside of uh, of this because this is something that I enjoy doing, but I want to do it on the side. I don't want to do it for for every day right it, it gets it's, it's lonely you know basically right um so yeah that's where i am right now just um you know i'm i'm with my parents until i'm i'm off probation because that's something that i'm still dealing with um, have you thought about being trying to be like a penetration specialist or yeah um uh yeah kind of like a white hat uh, you know basically that helps out people um testing their vulnerabilities and such and right. i have emailed and i have emailed some people because i because i really was um into back in the day i was into uh hacking websites defacing them putting up uh putting up my own uh home screen basically they would go to their website and they would be greeted with you've been hacked by, you know, such and right. such. If you want, if you want everything back, um, you send uh, Bitcoin or Monero, you know, and then we'll release, we'll release your stuff. Um, so, you know, that was another thing. And there was all kinds of little stuff like that I was doing um, online. Um, so, 
yeah, I mean, I, I would like to do something like that. It definitely would be nice to um, get out of the house more because I'm, you know, I'm on probation and I'm doing this from home. So I'm, I'm here a lot of, right. a lot of the day. Well, I mean, there are tests and stuff like you can take, you know, there's tests that you can take and get certifications. Yeah. So I'm, uh, there's a few things that I'm doing. I'm taking, um, not related to that, but I'm taking the Amazon course for like AWS, um, and, and a few other, uh, and a few other like online courses for, you know, just developing my skill set because at this, in this time in my life, you know, I haven't really had, um, a real job, you know, um, since, since shortly after high school. Um, so, um, I don't have, uh, you know, a resume to give to a company to say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a solid person. I know what I'm doing and stuff. If they look, they just see, you know, some old stuff and then they, they do the background check and, and, and that's when you get dismissed basically like, I'm sorry, we're, we're not interested right now. Right. So I'm dealing, uh, that's, that's basically, um, the main thing holding me back right now is that, uh, is, is, is the background checks and, um, being on probation and such, um, not being able to move around and, and do what I need to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, wait, what else do you think? We got anything else or, uh, um, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot like, is, I mean, is there anything else, uh, part of the story? I mean, I know I talked to you before, um, a couple, you know, last week, um, or whenever that was. And if there's any other questions you have from, from that or anything you're interested in, in learning about. No, I mean, I, I think that this was a good story. Like, I think that this was, you know, an interesting story. Um, I just didn't know if you wanted to, do you, do you want to like, um, do you want to promote like your social media or do you want to mention like you've got, I see, I mean, you've got your, your Instagram. Yeah. So my Instagram is dream.tech, uh, tech T E K. And then I have a YouTube channel, but I haven't really done any posting on it since before I got, um, arrested. Uh, you got a post so on it. That's what, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I actually just made a little update video the other day saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back, you know, I'm, uh, just trying to figure out what I'm going to do though. That's the problem that I'm having because before I was doing car stuff on, there. you know, I was, uh, building cars, show, showing, uh, the cars that I have, uh, racing, um, you know, basically all focused upon aftermarket, you know, modifying cars and such. But I do want to, uh, branch out into something else if I could. I mean, you could always Which, st start by telling your story, right? Yeah, you, know, you could break it apart into different pieces, like tell each piece very slowly and, and don't leave out any details, you know, don't skim over anything. And maybe it's six right. parts, maybe it's 12. Yeah, because there's definitely a lot of things in there. I mean, like the first time um, we had gotten in a high speed chase, uh, I was with a buddy of mine um, and I actually wasn't even driving. He was the one driving and I wasn't ready for it at the time, but I think that is uh, kind of, you know, like your first hit of a drug, uh, like crack or whatever. Right. Um, you're hooked, right? But that uh, kind of hooked me into the adrenaline thing, and that's when it started. So I was I was 17 or you know 18, I think maybe at the time, um, and that's what started me with the uh, uh, getting into police pursuits and stuff like that, and and, and uh, street racing, going to the races. Uh, you know, I was I would race for cash, um, you know, and I, and I did that. I tried to do that too. Uh, get money sometimes um, when I was, you know, withdrawing or whatever. I would go out uh, on a Friday night or, um, to try to find people to race. Say, hey, I'll, you know, let's go for a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, whatever. And I didn't even have the money, but I would, but I would pick on cars that I know I could beat, you know, because I was, because I had my, um, I would go out in my STI wagon. Basically, it's like six hundred horsepower, all wheel drive. Um, so. I was doing that 
Um, and, uh, yeah, so there was one time I got in, in a high-speed chase um, where I was on the freeway. It was late. It was probably 2 in the morning. Um, I was in one of my uh, Civics back then, um, and I, I'm running from this cop, and I get off on this exit, and I'm going so fast that I end up um, hitting the – it was a roundabout at the end of the off-ramp. And I go straight through the roundabout, right over the grass, right over the median. And then I get right back on the freeway. Um, so, and I actually lost the guy uh, by doing that because he thought I got off and, and went somewhere else. But I actually just got back on the freeway and he just couldn't see around the corner where the, where the, where the on-ramp was. Right. Um, so there was, there was all, there's all kinds of little, little stuff like that. Just crazy things that could have ended ended horribly um and uh, yeah there's there's a lot of things that i could that i could talk about so uh, that's what i'm i want to uh start doing things like that but i don't i don't really want to focus completely on on uh you know illegal things and in prison and stuff like that Um, no but you could talk about anything to do with like you know um you know with computers or with um you know, it doesn't have to be exactly one. I mean, you know, my channel is a lot about basically like true crime stories, but I, yeah. I branch off. I talk about other stuff sometimes. Like I've had people on here and I've talked to that have nothing to do with, you know, um, with uh, true crime. So, you know, um, it just slowly develops. The nice thing is when you start off a channel, it doesn't have to de- have a, anything specific right away because it's, it's developing and nobody's watching to begin with anyway. Yeah. So you can slowly figure it out. And then what happens is two years later, when you look back on those videos, people will go back and look at them. They'll make comments like, bro, I, you can totally see how you've improved over the yeah. year and how your, your channel started off with this. And then it developed into something completely different. So yeah, but what's important is to start posting. Yeah, definitely. And that's, and that's what I, that's what I started doing. Uh, or that's what I did. Um, I just made an update the other day, like, Hey, I'm coming back. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to uh, start with the YouTube thing again, because I did have some of that before I got locked up. Um, you know, I had, uh, I had probably uh, 1200 subscribers or something like that um, before I got locked up. Um, and um, was it yeah. monetized? It was, but I wasn't, I wasn't making anything. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was a couple cents basically uh, for, for a video. Um, you know, if I was lucky, uh, which I mean, I, I knew if I kept going with that, that it would get better. Um, but you know, I was also living this, this dual life where I was on YouTube doing this car stuff. But when I was off the camera, I'm doing all this drug stuff, um, and, right. and illegal stuff. So those two really don't mix, um, trying to, trying to put yourself in, in the public, you know, spotlight on, on, on the internet. And then doing this stuff, uh, it's just not, it won't mix. Right. Uh, Well, all right. All right. Well, I mean, I appreciate you, you know, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah. I, 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 thanks for, thank you for reaching out to me. Um, if you want, like, I can put, do you have like a link tree or you want me to, I can, uh, Colby can put your, your description in the description box. He can put all the links to your social media stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to just put that, uh, you know, in the video or in the description or whatever, you know, okay. Um, that's fine. No problem. Yeah. Let me wrap this. Let, let me, let me do an outro. Hold on real quick. Hold on. Hey, so if you like the video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos like this and also share the video. If you if you, Uh, If you liked it to your friends and family, leave me a comment in the comment section. I try and respond to almost all the comments. I respond to as many as I can. And uh, I really appreciate you guys watching and thank you very much. See ya. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, 
Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive, and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes, of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent. How a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Service's funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the U.S. government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini in the 1990s was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed, a twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic conman against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, 
the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison, and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's Residential Drug Abuse Program, known as RDAP, a drug program in name only. RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The Program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey. This first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program. How a con man survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' cult of RDAP. Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.